serious. Welcome everyone to the first episode of the European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities. My name is Sara Varmo, I'm the other host for you today. In this series, we wish to highlight solutions that other cities can use in their development. Every episode features one of the previous European Green Capital winner cities. Today's theme is sustainable urban mobility, and our guest today is, of course, Lisbon. And hello to everyone. My name is Jussi Knuttila, and I am the second co-host of today's episode. You can participate in the discussion by asking a question or writing a comment in the chat box on YouTube. I will then integrate your questions to the discussion here inside our studio. And since this is the first ever European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities episode, we would like to ask our viewers a question. Where are you joining us from? We would be thrilled to hear where we have listeners from. So write your comments down there in the box. We are excited to host five panelists today here with us. First, I would like to introduce you to a Mike Miguel Feliciano Caspar from the city of Lisbon, the European Green Capital 2020. Hi, Miguel. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here, and congrats for being the new the new European Green Capital. And uh, it, well, for us, it was a, an experience and a. And, uh, and uh, we were very happy to, to achieve that award. And um, it was a pity that it was in, in right in the middle of the COVID crisis, but we don't choose the moment. So, but very happy to be here today and share the experience with you. You did an excellent job anyway. Miguel is the deputy mayor of Lisbon for economy, innovation, mobility and safety. He has collaborated in many different projects with emphasis on the parking regulation, urban logistics, but also innovative on-demand public transportation solutions. It's great to have you here. Welcome, Miguel. Our next guest is Henna Virkkonen. Hello, Henna. Hello, everybody. And thank you for inviting me to this interesting discussion and panel. Great to have you here. Henna is currently serving her second term as a member of the European Parliament in the People's uh, Party group. She's an experienced MEP with energy and mobility issues. She's also very active in her uh, free time too. Her hobbies include ultra running and horseback riding, for instance. Joining us today from Jyväskylä. Great to have you here. Our third guest today is Lior Steinberg. Lior is a, an urban planner and the co-founder of Humankind, a collective accelerating the transition towards urban happiness for all. Lior helps cities to look beyond functionality and to plan urban spaces that make people smile. All the projects that Lior participates in, they have one thing in common. They create people-oriented cities. Joining us from Rotterdam, welcome to the studio, Lior. Hey, hello, and uh, thank you for the invite uh, from not very green, but a bit grey uh, Rotterdam. Grey and rainy. Great to, yeah, great to have you in the, in the discussion. Next, we have Anna Huttunen. Anna Huttunen is the project manager for sustainability and the Urban Innovative Actions Funded project CityCap. CityCap is a project that developed a model and an application for uh, personal carbon trading. Anna is enthusiastic about uh, cycling and walking conditions in the city of Lahti. And she's, uh, her hobbies are also uh, very outdoorsy. She likes to do outdoor hobbies. Anna's background is in social sciences and in urban and environmental governance. And joining us from Finnish Lapland, welcome Anna. Hi everyone, great to join you also remotely. Let's have a good discussion today. Yes, exactly. And our final guest is Ville Uusitalo. 
here sitting uh, next to me and Sara here on the couch. Ville is an associate professor in the Sustainability Change, Change Research Group in Lot University here in Lahti. Currently, Ville is leading the research part of the CityCap project related to personal carbon trade in mobility. Ville is an enthusiastic nature photographer and also bird watcher. And in terms of uh, sustainable mobility, Ville has mentioned how it is quite challenging to get to remote places without owning a car. And uh, yeah, welcome Ville to our studio. Thank you very much. It's great to participate in the discussion. It's great having you. Okay, now that you know all of our panelists, I would like to ask a quick question, quick and short question to our panelists. How did you move around today? What was your mode of transportation today? One to three words. I think we're going to start with Ville. Yeah, I have to say that I, I came by, by my car. That's, that's completely okay. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're here with us today. And uh, I think then we should go to Anna, to Lapland. I, I bet maybe skis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a little round with the cross-country skis. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, I got it right. And um, Lior, what about you? Uh, of course, the Netherlands is a bicycle. Oh, yes. I, I, I kind of guessed that answer. And... Uh, what about you, Henna? Today I have been working remotely in my home office, so I have been mostly walking around uh, <laughs> with my dog <laughs> between the meetings. And during the lunch break, I was also doing indoor cycling today. And I'm also planning to go to meet my horses after this panel. But then I think I, I need a car to drive to the stables. But we have very good uh, car sharing service uh, next to me so i'm often uh, using their cars so i'm favoring very much cycling and walking uh, when i'm staying in my home home city okay that's already four modes of transportation if mm -hmm. i if i count it right and then what about you miguel well there is a confinement going on in lisbon so i'm mostly at home today and so i guess i walked but if you count yesterday, then my vehicle was a cargo bike that I use often in my to move around the city and to take the, the kids when it's needed. So I would say the last the last vehicle I used was a cargo bike, but today I mo mostly walked. Mm. Okay. What about you, you say? Uh, it's been bus today, public transportation. That's my, my way to go from one place to another. What about you, Sara? I had to take a car, to be honest. Sometimes life is like that as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, Miguel, uh, the city of Lisbon has been awarded not only by the Green Capital, but also by the European Mobility Week Award in 2018. Today we have really one of the key actors behind all these mobility changes with us. Miguel, you have stated that uh, the reason why we won these awards was not that we would be the best in all the possible indicators, but it, it was because of our willingness to change. So what kind of changes you've made there in Lisbon? Could you tell us briefly? I think I think that's that's absolutely right. So we don't believe that we are the best of the world. We aim, we we aim to be, <laughs> but I think it's the speed of the change that that I think it's it's a it's a landmark here in Lisbon. Just to give you some some topics, for instance, one of the most important things that we have done was the transformation of the public space. The picture behind me right now, it was a place where you didn't have access to the river, for instance, and you, you, you mostly were, you have cars going, going through. And basically we created a garden and where, where people can walk. But the strategy that we have in place in the city, it's a very much about making the, the sidewalks wider and create plazas in every neighborhood. And, not, and not, that enable people, we doubled the, the model split for walking in the city. Another example, well, uh, it was made in 2019, we changed the tariffs of the public transport system and in one single year we augmented by 30% the demand in the system by changing the, the tariffs at the metropolitan area. 
It was the it was an agreement between the 18 municipalities of the metropolitan area that went demand went up by 30 percent in one single year, which is oh, wow. pretty amazing. That's really and, awesome. uh, and then if you look, for instance, also on bicycles, uh, four years ago we didn't have a shared bike scheme. Today we have, and we have more and more bicycle lanes, and we are pushing a, a, a network of bicycles. And for instance, during now the confinement, when all the transport modes are, are going down, we have less cars, less people moving in the public transport, but we have more and more people cycling. So it's a, it's a transport mode that is being more and more adapted from by the people. Um, and then finally, I think we are a city very open to innovation. And so we have we have very interesting stuff to tell about what happened, what we have done with these scooters, sharing systems, things like that. And basically, by being open to innovation, I think mobility operators are choosing Lisbon to launch their products. And so we have a strong ecosystem where you can actually have several options uh, to use, uh, no, of not using your car. And besides that, finally, I would say also we are a spe specific programs that we have for the schools. Because if you look to, to the big picture, we have several targets to achieve by 2030 and 2050, and they will be the adults then. So we have a lot of things going on with children. Mm -hmm. It seems that you have a really strong project going on. Has there been anything really difficult for you? Maybe also personally, has something been difficult in this, all these yeah. actions that you made? I think I think one one has to be very firm in the direction that that we are moving. If you if you look to what Antonio Guterres said, the Secretary General of the United Nations, he was very clear in these words: "We are losing the race against the climate change." So we need bold and decisive act, decisive action till 2030, and we are running late. And when you speak with every anyone, er, most people agree with this topic. So we need to have a more sustainable city, and we need to to have uh, proper solutions. But then when you put it in the, in the individual perspective, we all have a story to tell why we behave how we behave. So and okay, so I guess the most difficult part, it's of course, we, you cannot force people to do things that are not convenient to them. So you have to have convenient solutions for them. But at the same time, it is this, this, this difference of speed of, of where we agree on the collective side and how slow we change in the individual side which is, I think, it's the most difficult things to deal with, and but we have to understand it, manage it, and 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 uh, and make people change their behavior as fast as we can. Sometimes by providing providing them better better alternative services. So, but this is the most difficult thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. The culture change it takes yeah. really time. Um, what would you say would be the the key actions for the future in Lisbon? sustainable urban mobility? I think Lisbon is in, in a path where it's more and more clear that the role of the cities is changing. The cities will not be, uh, no, not, won't be for much more time infrastructure managers. Of course, we have to manage the infrastructure, the lightning pole, the road, the sidewalk, of course, that's that's our role for the past centuries, I guess. But but we are, we need to move to a place where we more and more will we will manage services mobility services. If you if you want a bit like the air traffic control in the airport, where where the planes have slots that arrive, arrive to the city and there is communication between the planes and the and the airport, we are lacking that language in the cities and how we communicate with urban logistics. How do you communicate with ride hailing services? How do you, how, how can you share information? Where are the, where is the free parking spots? And with that, reducing the congestion for people cruising for parking. So this kind of interaction and this angle, language between vehicles, operators and cities, I believe is changing. And in the 10 year time or so, I think cities will have, a, 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 have will be, will be more responsible to manage mobility, meaning at this time of the day, at this right place, you can enter and maybe the other guy needs to come on the next slot. And, and this needs a co-governance between the public and the private side that we are very, very far away to have. And for sure, we have to get together, get together between the public and the private side, have a, a round table going on, uh, start a conversation and move in this direction. I think that's the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's, it's a lot about mobility as a service, right, as well. Uh, Lior, you have heard the story, the transformation story of Lisbon. Would you like to shortly maybe comment on what Miguel said? 
Yeah, I think I've been, I've been to Lisbon two years ago. Unfortunately, the last trip a few months ago was cancelled due to the situation. But I, lo I, I love the story of uh, creating more places, more plazas. What you can see really in Lisbon is that it's not about the journey and uh, entering a car and going from A to B. It's truly a city where you have the between the A and B, you have the C, D, E and F, all those points that you can stop, sit. I think it's a city that I've seen the most sitting possibilities in the world. It is a, and that, that's a great mobility city in a way where you can sit. And a great city. <laughs> I, I love Lisbon as well. Lior, uh, this discussion of uh, changing cities and city spaces, but also the cultural change that we just uh, discussed, it must be quite familiar to you as an urban planner, but also as the co-founder of Humankind. Uh, what made you personally interested in the urban change? What started it all? Yeah, well, I, I grew up in Tel Aviv, which is maybe the only real city in Israel, uh, which always made me think what makes Tel Aviv so special. But when I lived there, I owned the car. I only used the car, although I was already an urbanist, let's say, and I was already excited about the bicycle. It was just impossible. When I moved to Berlin, I, I tried to use the bicycle. It, it is just impossible. You are pushed to use the car or the metro. I, of course, use the metro because it's just more efficient. It's, it's so efficient in Berlin. And only when I moved to the Netherlands, I started using the bicycle, just like the prime minister or just like the least paid person in the factory. Everybody uses the bicycle or the vast majority of uh, journeys are by the bicycle. And this really made me understand that if we want to change the way that people are moving and living in cities, we must change cities. I cannot blame the Lior that lived in Israel for not cycling. It's just very dangerous. But I can work in Tel Aviv, change Tel Aviv, and make it much possible to my family and friends to cycle. And I think that this is, well, with cycling, the Netherlands can teach a lot, but with outer space, Lisbon can teach a lot. Uh, um, Every, every city in Europe has a great lesson. Yeah. That's, that's totally true. The cities really affect how we move from, from one place to another. And uh, in your web page, and also what I stated in your uh, short bio, uh, you state that uh, I help cities to look beyond functionality and to plan urban spaces that make people smile. I think we are still pretty far away from this fun ideology uh, fun city ideology here in Finland. So how should we get started with this approach? Uh, how do we get started? What's, what's your uh, tip? Well, the, the smile might sound a shallow thing. Yeah, we want people to smile. But for me, it's truly because it, it is so difficult to define what is a great city or what is a great street. But when you get there, you feel it. You normally smile, you see other people smile. When I work on public space, I'm always asking myself, hey, is it possible that people will fall in love here or that uh, grandparents will go with their gra uh, grandchildren to this space and play? Uh, and I think that when we are talking about mobility, we are very quickly going into the efficiency question, where will I park my car, how will I get to work? And we're forgetting that people are moving to cities because they want to meet other people, they want to uh, experience different uh, di different adventures that they can experience in the, in, in the village uh, where there are less people. And this is the, the most important role of a city. I can, I can share one very quick example. Oh, I yes, don't know do if that. you yeah, can see my... See. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's still taking some time. I hope now it is uh, showed or not. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a, an example of a street in Tel Aviv, uh, where uh, we were, the municipality just decided that due to Corona to close it off, remove all parking spaces, and um, just make it car free. Uh, and it didn't really work. People were very angry. The city said, yeah, we need to have car free places. And the neighbors were very angry because suddenly they don't have a place to put their car. But the place was dead, and what we did uh, together with Urban 95 and uh, other uh, great organizations in the city was to 
uh, suggest, hey, let's make this place also a fun place. Show people, okay, you get rid of the cars, but there is something else to do. And this is how the place looks now. Instead of parking cars, there are parking children. That's where you see the real smile. And when you have a place that is so successful, that almost look as successful as the renders that we did before, you now have a different discussion. Do you want the cars back or do you want to keep this space a great square? And this is, of course, just one example, but uh, I think it shows that we can change the discussion if we start talking about not only parking yes or no or cars yes or no. Yeah, the difference was so huge. I, I, I cannot see the same street uh, uh, with, with cars anymore. I like the idea of, of a baby or a, a children park there. That's, <laughs> yeah, cannot, cannot, um, yeah, I'm always smiling when, when hearing about this approach. Henna, after hearing Lior's approach, I want to ask you, is your hometown Jyväskylä a fun city? <laughs> I was very happy to hear that Lear's, you know, duty is to accelerate urban happiness. I think it's, it sounds very, very good. And I think uh, Jyväskylä is, is a very nice place to live in. And we can see often when we are asking also public opinion, normally um, Jyväskylä is placed as a second or third in, in the Finnish rankings. When we are asking Finnish citizens that what is the city where you would like to live or where good, you could like to live. And I, I think uh, one of the main reasons for that is that the Jyväskylä is quite a compact place. So we don't have very long distances. And I think uh, most of the services and the housing areas are easy to reach by walking or cycling. And there is very lively student life because uh, students are a very big part of their uh, inhabitant uh, in, in Jyväskylä. And also, I think for the Finnish people, it's quite important to have uh, easy access to, to nature in the way, uh, to the lakes and forests. And I think nature, lakes and forests, they are very nearby here everywhere. So I think it's quite important for the Finns. And here we can see also, I think that there is... Uh, different things what the citizens uh, value in different uh, member states in Europe. And that is something I think we have to take account when we are speaking about urban planning and urban mobility, that there is very different regions in, in Europe. And for example, in Finland, where right now we have one meter snow and minus 15 degrees, we have different possibilities for urban mobility than, for example, you in Rotterdam or Lisbon right now. Mm, that's an excellent point indeed. And Jyväskylä is also one of those cities have, that have made a really good transformation uh, towards more pedestrian-friendly city. You have done a lot of work with the city centre, so that's really also visible there when you, when you visit there. Um, Henna, you are really an experienced MEP. In short, uh, could you also give us an overview of what EU is currently thinking about sustainable urban mobility? I... Uh, general level, I can say that it's very, very high priority in the European Union politics. As you know, our main target is to be climate neutral by uh, 2050 in the European level. Finland is having uh, even much uh, more ambitious target and also Lahti. Uh, but uh, because it's, it's the priority in European policies now to reach the climate neutrality, of course, it means that... Uh, Transport and mobility is really in heart of this transformation because we know that if we're looking at the emissions, uh, transport sector is the only sector where the emissions, they have been increasing all the time. So we are having very big challenges. And uh, now we have set a target that we want to cut emissions from the transport sector by 90% by 2050. So it means that we need to very, very big changes in all the levels and all the transport modes. And uh, I think uh, there's uh, kind of like two mega trends in the transport policy in European level. Uh, one is the uh, decarbonization and uh, green transformation. And the other one is digitalization. And they go really hand by hand. And you have also seen that now when we are speaking about the recovery, in the European level, these are also the main priorities where we want to invest in Europe, uh, in, the, uh, in the member states level and also in the European level, uh, reaching the targets of Green Deal and supporting the green transition and then also 
um, boosting the digi digitalization. And I think uh, sustainable urban mobility is very much uh, in heart of this policies because we know that uh, over 40% of the Europeans, they live in the cities and urbanization trend will continue. So of course the cities, they are really in heart of this, all, all the planning we are doing in the European level. Uh, just before Christmas, European uh, Commission was publishing the new sustainable and smart mobility strategy. And there is now more than 80 different initiatives that how we will uh, have the greens and dig digital transformation in, in transport sector. And there's also many, many actions which are having uh, connections to, to the urban, urban uh, mobility planning. And for example, one of the targets is uh, that 100 European cities uh, should be climate neutral by 2030. And in the European level, we are also planning to fund uh, these cities in this green transformation. I know that Lahti is more ambitious and Lahti wants to be climate neutral five years before that in 2025. But in the European level, now the target is that we should have 100 cities which are climate neutral by 2030. So they will be really front runners. And uh, the idea is also that they should be innovation hubs for all the cities that we could uh, also share the best practices and experiences. And I think uh, really the urban planning and uh, urban mobility planning, they are really uh, in core of these all policies. It's great to hear. It's actually really interesting. I'm, I'm pretty sure that there in the audience, we have a lot of cities that could be joining this movement of 100 climate neutral cities by 10, 2030. So, so keep, in, keep in mind also the European Green Capital Network. Um, well, it's also true that we are struggling economically. So um, what do you think, how should cities tackle these sustainable urban mobility questions simultaneously? when they are doing a lot of difficult decisions with their economy. So how to, how to play with the budgets? Uh, I don't think that this is something that, uh, that we can't do it is because it's so expensive. <laughs> because I think it's something we have to do if we want to have that kind of cities which are attractive and where, which will be how, how it will, if we want to accelerate the urban happiness like uh, uh, Lear, uh, was saying. So I think it's something very important that all the cities should take account that how to make the city more attractive and climate friendly. And I think all the, all the time, of course, the cities, they have to um, do new housing and renovations. And I think really this uh, um, mobility, urban mobility sustainable mobility should be part of all the planning, what we are doing in the cities, because it's really important that we are, just like we, we heard that in we have cities where it's really dangerous, for example, to cycle. So I think these are the things that we should take account when we are planning the city, that how we could make it more uh, friendly for walking or cycling, and how we could have easy access to public transport and how we should uh, plan the whole logistics uh, in the in the city level. So I don't think that it's uh, it's something that, oh, it's so expensive that we can't do it because I think we all need to uh, have that kind of cities where we can innovate new things and we can also boost uh, digital ideas and innovations and also combine them with all the green transition. So. I see that there is so big possibilities for all the cities. So I think uh, uh, in all the decision makers in the local level, they should really take account this, that uh, how we could make these uh, cities more attractive and nice places to live in. And of course, we have also in the European level, we have possibilities to fund these projects. Uh, I already mentioned these recovery plans and all the member states, they are now doing their own planning that what they are funding uh, via this recovery plan uh, and recovery funding and uh, green transition and di digitalization, they will be uh, the priorities in this program. So I think uh, all these urban uh, projects, they fit very well to these um, plans. And also, I was mentioning this target that we should have 100 uh, climate neutral cities by 2030. So we have now the new research program, Horizon Europe, 
And there is new European mission for climate neutral and smart cities, and it will support 100 cities to, in their transformation to this climate uh, neutrality. And uh, the idea is, like I said, that those cities, they could be innovation hubs for all the European cities. So this is something to where we are also now um, planning to give this uh, research and development funding from the Horizon Europe program uh, for the cities to, to reach these targets. So I think there is possibilities to get extra funding also from the European level and also from the member states level. But of course, it's something that should be in core of all the decision making in the local level also to uh, take this account that how we could have uh, um, more sustainable mobility in our cities. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hannah. That's a really, really strong message. Also, keeping in mind that we're going to have the local municipal elections coming very soon. So that's going to be one of the, the topics that we probably are going to talk a lot. And it's great to hear that we have possibilities also to fund in national and regional and also in EU wide level. So that's that's great news for us. For sure. And this is also the perfect time to talk about new innovations when it comes to sustainable urban mobility. So EU also brings us surprising possibilities to try out something completely new. Here Sara has the world's first personal carbon trading application CityCap open, which uh, shows Sara's emissions, mobility emissions uh, for the week. This pilot uh, phase of the project is running until this March. Anna, you have been working as the project manager for CityCap and you also work as the sustainable manager of Lahti. So this has been the first time ever that a city has been testing this kind of personal carbon trading uh, scheme. Where did you come up with this idea? Where did this idea come from? Uh, well, I think the idea for the project came when the when city of Lahti, the innovative people there like uh, Sara and, and then the skilled researchers of LUT um, discussed and came up with the idea. They wanted to try something new, something, a new tool, how to engage citizens, like to make the people part of the change and give them a tool to um, like make the change. And um, there has been several pilots or like smaller research pilots on uh, personal carbon trading um, around the world. Mainly 10 years ago, it was a topic that was discussed. For instance, there was a pilot in the UK and then there was one pilot, like a small pilot uh, in the Norfolk Island in Australia. But by then they decided or they came up with the conclusion that it was still too early for personal carbon trading. So I guess what we have now done in the CityCap project is that we have really brought back uh, the personal carbon trading into discussion. And that's very interesting, in my opinion. And in these uh, days, um, uh, digitalization and uh, these are very topical things. So I think the timing is, is uh, just perfect. And. Uh, how would you set up the CityCap pilot experiment if you would do it again? You can start telling about the pilot, but also um, what kind of difficulties? Tell about your personal um, opinions. Um, yeah, it has been a trip, so to say. I mean, um, it's it has been like it's been great, but it has also been very challenging to develop something like this from the scratch. Um, I mean, I think we can be very proud that we have been able to really develop a functioning application and a functioning personal carbon trading uh, behind in only three years time and that we have been actually piloting the like ready app already more than one year. Um, but yeah, from that, I guess I can get to to the like um, yeah, question of, of time. I mean, um, if I could change something, um, definitely we would take more time for the development phase. Um, maybe a couple of more years. <laughs> I guess we would also try to make it even lighter so it would be um, easier to replicate to other cities in the world. And I guess 
it would be also very interesting and also very important um, in regards to get like um, data that can be compared to have like several cities simultaneously doing the pilot so that they could, I mean, you could get the synergy of developing it together, but also get all the data from that. So I guess those are the things that mm, we might do differently if we, we got the chance. Uh, could you, Anna, briefly still explain about the functionality of this application? I'm, unfortunately, we can't uh, show you it in a larger picture, but just to, to make people a little bit more aware of what it is actually. It recognizes the mobility, but what happens there? Yeah, of course. So uh, the basic idea of our application is that um, when the user starts using the application, they will be allocated a personal carbon budget, and that will be based on their um, current life situation. So that, for instance, if you live very far away from the city center, or if you have several children, or you work very far away, you will get a like a bigger carbon budget for the week. And um, then you will just have your mobile phone with you and then you will be traveling around and it will automatically detect your uh, different mobility modes and then uh, calculate the CO2 footprint of your mobility. And by the end of the week, then you will see if you have um, surpassed or, or gone below your budget. And if you have saved some of your budget, um, you will earn some virtual euros. And then uh, further on, you can change the uh, virtual euros um, on the marketplace of the application into discounts or city services. So basically for the user, the logic is, is very simple. So it's very automatic. You don't have to do that much um, just to keep your location on and, and take your phone with you wherever you go. It seems that I've spent six kilos this week. I still have a some budget left. That's good. Ville, oh, well done. You, <laughs> <laughs> Ville, uh, Lut University has played a major role in the project. Um, throughout the pilot, what kind of scientific knowledge you have gained? Uh, we have gained a lot of new scientific knowledge from several perspectives, because when we started this project, there was some like, theoretical understanding, like how this kind of personal carbon trend model could work. But there, as Anna mentioned, there was only very limited practical implementations and they were mainly like small scale implementations. So we were able to, to create a whole new system and to discuss with people, to get feedback, to analyze data and to see like what was working in our, our approach, what could be done otherwise. Uh, uh, we also faced as Anna mentioned, many challenges from which we learned. learned, And I think uh, we have a lot of knowledge how this kind of system could be implemented in the future. Of course, we also got a lot of data how people feel about fairness of this kind of system and how, how it maybe impacts on users' mobility and, and also how people are moving in Lahti because we get also ge geographical data. We haven't analyzed that yet so much, but, but Basically, it's there, so we know how, where people are cycling, where they are driving a car, where they are walking, and it could be maybe in the future also used for city planning. Mm -hmm. I've heard that you get a lot of contacts also from other cities, both in Finland but also abroad. Yeah. So, um, I, if you could summarize somehow the, the city-wide level results, I think other cities would be interested about those. Yeah. Um, Based on, based on the final survey that we just did for, for our, our users, 40% of people said that, that they reduced their mobility emissions due, due to using this app. Maybe the reductions weren't like significant, but at least it made people to think where my mobility emissions come from, what can I do? And, and it's, it seems that this information, and also there were quite many users who said that they wanted to challenge themselves in trying to stay within the limit. So, and, and then the third, third was the incentives and virtual euros that you were able to earn. But, but at least I think it could be one tool uh, to provide information for users and also to impact on users' uh, mobility emissions without any like uh, investments in infrastructure or public transportation or 
uh, new energy sources. So I think it could be like one piece of this palette how to solve mm. system. Great. Yeah. And the piloting phase was also um, at the same time when we were having the, the first COVID outbreak, right? Exactly. Um, so you also saw the results of that. Yeah. Um, I would like to actually ask uh, from our panelists, uh, maybe from uh, Mikuel first. Um, so how did actually the COVID influence on the, the mobility actions and the, the things that you were discussing? Did that have an any effect in the city? Well, it has. First and first, I think it has a very, very, very positive impact in everything which is more important. Should we invest more in public transport? Yes. For instance, the funds that are, were being told about the, the European Commission funds. Basically, there is an agreement here at the metropolitan level between the 18 municipalities that we should concentrate the funds from the those the funds from the recovery funds in public transport and housing policies. Uh, and there is a very strong agreement on that. And so we ha that has been articulated with the government and the Portuguese government is pushing that agenda, for instance. And uh, as well, for instance, the topics on, uh, on, the, on the cycle paths and bicycle lanes and all that. So I think many cities are pushing that and we are pushing that agenda. But of course, it also has a huge impact in, in mobility. And there is, a, there is a topic which is all about digitalization and the future of work. Because I strongly believe that after COVID, some part of these of these new habits will remain, and I think people will, will work more remotely than they, they did before the COVID, which is absolutely re residual here in at least in Lisbon. And if you start seeking the impacts of someone that instead of commuting to Lisbon every day, starts instead of commuting every day only one one week or the other or two days of the week, for instance then personal choices where where is the school where i put the kids is the, is it near the home or near the, the 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 office people start changing their mobility patterns because maybe today they are bringing the kids to, to school in lisbon because it's more convenient because they bring the kids to school they, they bring the car but then if they stay home then maybe they they don't need the car to come to lisbon because they no longer bring the kids here. So this, I think there is be, there's going to be a, a, a big impact in the overall after the COVID of new mobility habits. But in, one, in what concerns the mobility agenda, I think COVID is just pushing in the right direction because basically we understood that we cannot afford to keep, to have air, air pollution issues in the cities. We need a more sustainable, uh, a more sustainable pattern of, 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 of way of life. And so we, are, we need to change the way we leave the cities and we need to discarbonize and we and we need to deliver the commitment and the promise that we, need, we did to our kids, which was the Paris Agreement uh, targets. So in that topics, I think that the, the Paris Agreement accelerated that. Also, I just had what to, only wanted to comment very briefly what was said before, because I, I don't think that we should separate economy from sustainability. Sustainability is not a cost, it's actually an opportunity for our economy. And if you look, for instance, uh, the, the example of what Lior has, show, has shown in Tel Aviv, we have the same approaches here in Lisbon of tactical urbanism, where we, we occupy the streets. That kind of uh, actions actually save jobs, because restaurants that didn't have the customers now have more customers because the people are moving to that plaza or that road. And now people, so when jo the job was saved and the, the economy, it's they are actually employing more people in those areas. So even in the in the COVID crisis. So, so and another example, for instance, that we we monitor in the long term trend, where we we augmented the sidewalks and we create more opportunities for people to walk in the city. If you look to the to the POS transactions for the the credit card transactions on those streets, you have more value being transacted now. It accelerated regardless regarding the rest of the city. So a better urban environment brings more 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 dynamics to the local business brings more value to the to the land so again sustainability it's a, it's a, it's actually it's a mission it's a it should be our our way of life in a way that we we guarantee uh, proper cities for the next generations but it's not bad for business I mean, so it's also it's also good for business and, and we should have that in mind because we should not see this as a cost Right, and if, if talking with the economic terms, maybe one could say that that's a good investment for the city. So we heard uh, stories of change 
from Lisbon, Rotterdam, Jyväskylä and Lahti. It seems that there is an ongoing change in urban environment that it has so much to do with mobility questions. Leor, briefly, what do you think, uh, if looking at the near future, what is the most interesting trend for urban mobility this year? Well, I think it's easy, of course, you can say uh, e-scooters are uh, coming. I mean, that's obviously a technological trend, but the biggest trend, I guess, is the it's probably the first year that we have the opportunity to change routines of people. It's very difficult to change the routines of people. That's why it's much easier to convince someone who changes job or move to a new city to change their mode of transit. But now we kind of resetted the entire routines of everybody. Everybody was forced, unfortunately, to stay at home for many, many months, not drive or cycle. And now we have the opportunity to change it. So I hope that the trend will be that there will be political willingness, as we already heard by the EU and the cities, to continue this uh, trend. And when Corona is over, and hopefully it will be soon, not just to remove the tactical bike lanes, not just open back the streets to cars, uh, just allow this uh, new routine uh, to grow uh, sustainably. That would be an enduring change. Um, Villa, do you agree with this? Yeah. I, what I think is very interesting after uh, COVID era is like whether people will continue working from home, how they are using ICT technology also, uh, and whether this impact their behavior and working schedules. And this may have a direct impact on congestions, uh, on, on mobility amounts, like car amounts in cities. And I think there is a possibility that it, it if the congestion peaks, for example, are reduced, there is no, not as much need for parking because more people are working from home or from somewhere else. It may release space also for other development like bicycle lanes or, or as, as Lyre uh, also, also presented. So it could also be that a slow commute will uh, surface and uh, it might be even hard to pack people into buses and uh, packed uh, subways. I, I have been reading the uh, chat here. Um, I, I should say to our viewers that uh, you can ask a question uh, from our panelists. So uh, please send, send us questions to Lior, Henna, Anna, Ville or Nikel about anything. Uh, so far, I have just gotten very good greetings all over the world. Romania, France, Austria, uh, Hamburg, uh, Spain. And I have one comment. Don't park cars, park children. Love the idea. Greetings from Lahti. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, one question to Miguel while we are waiting for the, the viewers to ask something more. Uh, if we think about people and organizations, maybe also companies behind these, these future t trends, who do you think is making the, the greatest uh, achieve, achievements in the near future or who are the, the change makers? Well, it's a tricky question, but uh, to, be, to be honest, I'm sorry to go back to again to the same topic, but uh, I, I always go because I, I, see, I really, really believe it was a very important step. Well, again, going to move back to the Paris Agreement. In the Paris Agreement, basically, there was a triangle of stakeholders, which was the countries, and you see the countries moving for neutral carbon, neutral, neutral carbon policies. You see the you see the cities, and you see the companies. So let's focus on the cities and the companies. That's where where I, I strongly believe that where that's where the change hits the ground if you want to cities need to keep changing their 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 urban space their public transport networks the opportunities that they offer to 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 the to the citizens to to experience the citizens in a different way but we won't achieve the targets that we want to achieve in 2030 if companies don't move they have a huge impact in the economy they have a huge imp inco impact at the operational level, if you think in logistics, for instance, they have a huge impact on the way that people move to work with their kind of policies that they have when they have a company car or when they pay the public transport pass, things like that. And they have a huge impact in the way they design their facilities, 
if people can ride a bicycle to work or if people can uh, can have a kindergarten to leave the, the, the kid in the school things like that so it's very very important and i think that's one of the biggest landmarks that the, the the european green capital left here in lisbon because basically what we did here was we in we used the green capital word to create a new compromise between till between for the for the time between 2020 2030 which was a call for action so we use the word not in a way to to congratulate us for what we achieved but as a starting point for what we still needed to achieve till 2030 and so we invited the more than 200 entities that will represent a lot of of jobs here in lisbon and to to commit with concrete actions. So it was not a, a flower power thing where did you know in people write, you know what, we will behave. It was not not like that. It was concrete actions. We are going to have more electric cars. We are going to pay for the monthly public for the for the monthly public transport pass. We are going to pay for mobility services. We 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 will create conditions for people to park a bicycle and change the clothes when they arrive to work. We will put more more uh, more um, local generation, electricity generation, so solar pod, solar panels, and things like things like that, to to reduce our carbon footprint in the city. So it was it was concrete measures that all these entities um, committed to do, and now we are following up that 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 compromises. And so so sorry for the long answer, but I think cities must act. But I think that's common knowledge. But then yeah, companies but, also yeah. must act. And I think there is a lot to be done also on the company side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great message, of course, from Lisbon, being the green capital. And you have been doing a lot of actions and, and great to hear that you will continue with the work. Um, what about you, Anna? What do you think about uh, when, when thinking about future makers or change makers? Who are they? Uh, what Mikael said was very interesting and I, I, I could not agree more on that. First of all, I mean, because also um, I think that, I mean, cities, we are responsible for investing in, in infrastructure that really enables the sustainable mobility, um, make more safer, make more convenient cycling ways, etc. So that really, really get the people on the street. We get the older people on the street and the younger people. We get a safe way to the school. But then on the other hand, um, I think like building these kind of networks between the companies and the city, that's something that is still still lacking a bit in regards um, to sustainable mobility also, for instance, in Lahti. So I think that's a very, uh, very good idea to do. Um, but yeah, I guess, yeah, I think cities are very important and that's why I think we have to work hard every day and we need to somehow um argumentate to our decision makers that they have the courage to make the decisions that we need that they put money in the right places and are not afraid of of building a city that's not attractive anymore because it's the opposite great so cities play a major role we hopefully we also track attract the the bright minds to work here with within the city so that's also needed. What about you, Henna? Um, what would you say? Who would be the change makers? I think also that uh, the innovations, they are very much made on the local level. And here I think the cities are important platforms or for all these innovations. Of course, it's important that all the main stakeholders are involved. Citizens, of course, uh, uh, and inhabitants, and also, for example, researchers, schools uh, in the local level, and of course, also the industry and the companies. So I think that's how the best innovations are made on the local level. And in the European level, we have to take care and make sure that we have uh, that kind of uh, regulatory framework that encourages innovations, and especially now, for example, when I'm thinking about digitalization, because I think it's a uh, 
it's really if we are speaking that what is the you know major thing in this year i think it will be the digitalization of course it has been mega trend already many years but now covid-19 crisis i think it has very much accelerated now the development in this field we have seen for example how yes um, of course now most of the people they have been working remotely nearly one year now and also e-commerce has been growing very rapidly and all kind of for example home delivery services and so on so I think it's uh, it's changing now our our economy and uh, also the society very very uh, fast and also the job markets so I think it will be the mega trend also in the mobility which and it will have uh, many consequences but uh, especially when I'm thinking thinking about uh, digitalization there is important that we have European framework in legislation which is encouraging innovations and here for example, when we speak about the mobility as service or sh sharing economy or multimodal transport system, it's important that we have, for example, access to data and we have that kind of clear rules uh, which are making the innovations possible in the European level. And that's where, to where we are focusing now very much in the, in the European level in our regulation and legislation to look that it's a fit for purpose and it's uh, encouraging new innovations and investments, which are uh, important part of our green and digital trans transition. Thank you. Thank you, Henna. Now I have six questions here, uh -huh. but we also let's have the last question. Yeah, let's. Yeah, I will. I will pick very quickly. <laughs> uh, one. Uh, my question is regarding the opportunity of using electric cars and electric buses as a energy storage method for renewable energy. Could you, Ville, just very quickly uh, tell? Um, have Have you heard about this kind of research, or is this something that you have also planned, or? Yeah, I know that there is this discussion and there is research related to use of electric cars, uh, electric buses, uh, somehow to smoothen the electricity production, because when we have a lot of renewable electricity production, it will fluctuate quite heavily. So there is research going on on whether we could store electricity when there is extra production and then use it when, when it's needed. But I'm not an expert in details related to this topic. But I think it's an interesting, interesting discussion and, and research field. Thank you, Ville. And I see we only have a couple of minutes left. Should yeah. we go to the last Let, question? Let's take one. Another. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, I think this would be for um, Anna. How do we connect healthcare to mobility? Question to a very <laughs> wide uh, question. How do we connect healthcare to mobility? Yes. Um, um, well, at least active mobility has health benefits and also that that of course leads to to savings in healthcare costs. So I guess that's like the most uh, clearest linkage that you can have so that when you promote active sustainable mobility, um, yeah, you you get savings and you get more healthy people. Right. That's a great answer. Um, so now we are jumping into a time machine. Think about the, the world after five to ten years. What would you predict that would happen in regards to urban mobility? We would like to hear comments from each of you, but let's be very, very, very short, short. Like within <laughs> one sentence, what would happen uh, in regards after five to ten years? Let's start uh, from here. So. Really? Yeah, what I maybe take one new aspect which is not discussed so much. So in five years, uh, quite big share of cars that we are already now using, they will be in use also after five years. But we will have increased uh, amount of electric cars, gas operated cars and, and, and cars that are suitable for al alternative energies. And, and with a little longer perspective, I'm, I really hope that we will also have some, some like sustainably produced synthetic fuels, which we can mm -hmm. use then in the existing of mm -hmm. cars mm -hmm. to reduce okay, emissions. Right. Even shorter, even shorter. <laughs> Thanks yeah. a lot, Ville. Sorry. But Lior, what do you think after five to ten years? I would say much, much more car-free city centers. Uh, plenty of car-free city centers. Henna, what about you? What do you think? 
Uh, I think that the transport will be much more clean and efficient and smoother and safer than today. And I also see that in the urban places, or I think walking and cycling, uh, they will be the main main modes of transport. And then I'm very much uh, waiting for autonomous uh, driving and vehicles because I think it will be much more nice and safe when we will have this automated driving and vehicles. So I have high expectations for that. Great to hear. Thank you. Anna, what do you think? Um, to put it very short, I would say a 15-minute city and neighborhoods. Perfect. And Miguel? Yeah. I guess last I agree with this, with this last one. I, I think we'll have slower and quieter, and quieter streets. And that will mean that probably I will be able to walk in the street with my kids without giving them their hand, their hand, my hand. Not because they are older, but because it's safer. So, so that I think that's that will be a major goal to have safe streets for the kids. Super nice answer. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Miguel. So this was the end of our first uh, European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities episode. Very exciting. It's, mm. it's, it's the first episode. How, how did it go, Sara? Well, I think we had, a, had a, actually quite fun and I learned yeah. so much from other cities. It's really interesting to hear about those experiences. Same here. And uh, yes, a really short teaser about our next episode. So we will have our next European Dialogue uh, series on 3rd March, so in one month. And the theme of the episode is going to be eco-innovation. And we are hosting the first green capital city from 2010, the city of Stockholm. We're also going to hear more about the role of hydrogen in our city's um, economies in the future. All right. Wow, that's exciting. So thank you very much, our great panelists. It was great pleasure to have you here. Also, all the viewers joining us today. So stay tuned. This is the European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities. And we want to conclude tonight with great message and mood from Lisbon. No, it's not you yet. You are me still. But maybe you can hear my thoughts. Are you scared? Of course you are. You don't know what is this? What's earth? Water? Wind? Maybe you can see it through my dreams. You must have seen the others. So different. The colors. Shapes sizes and the equals their eyes the way they look to you and to things look we are raising a city here connected with People, trees, animals, technology, sky, and earth. Sun, you have your own lungs now. Breathe for the first time. to hear and to be heard. You will walk and explore and expand my joy. You will play, travel, Learn, work, 
share, create, recycle, innovate. You will be happy here. And then one day, your own seeds will too grow with love. We no longer separate city from nature. You can go now, anywhere. You are part of everything. You are the city, my son. We called you Lisboa. <laughs>